Thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. So Ryan Thriver is an Associate Professor of Atmospheric Science at the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. And prior to starting his professorship in 2012, he worked as a research associate in Penn State's Department of Geosciences and as a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow in Penn State Department of Meteorology after graduating from Purdue University with a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. His research seeks to better understand the physical processes influencing variability within Earth's climate and to quantify relevant uncertainties using numerical models observational products and statistical methods. And that leads us to today's webinar, where he will be discussing the influence of uncertainties on the tails of climate projections. And with that, thank you for joining us today, Ryan, and I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Tom and Jenny. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking remotely, speaking with this virtual group. And uh, I thought I'd share some uh, recent work that we're doing uh, as part of a DOE project. Uh, this is very much ongoing work, so uh, I appreciate the, the the feedback and kind of discussion style setting of this meeting, and hopefully it leads to some good discussion. So yeah, uh, the stuff that we're working on these days is uh, extremes, climate and weather extremes, and their importance for multi-sector analysis. So this is a project that is being, uh, uh, it's a collaborative project uh, through PEACHES, the Program on Coupled Human and Earth Systems, uh, which is a DOE center focused again on multi-sectoral dynamics. And a lot of the work that I'll show today is being, uh, is, has been led by David Lafferty. So he's a, a PhD student working in my group uh, at the University of Illinois, uh, but it's also in close collaboration with Tom Akiki and Tom Hurdle, or Iman Akiki and Tom Hurdle at Purdue University, who work in agricultural economics, and Klaus Keller and Rob Nicholas at Penn State University from the Department of Geosciences, and also uh, Wolfram uh, Schlenker at Columbia University, uh, who works in ag econ. So, um, with that's kind of the introduction. So, we'll just go ahead and get started. So, why do we care about extremes? Why do we care about the tales of, of weather and climate? It's because uh, they cause economic damages. Uh, uh, climate impacts and damages are closely linked <clears throat> to extreme or rare weather and climate events. So here's some examples such as drought. There's a big snowstorm uh, in Chicago a few years back, lake effect snowstorm that left a lot of people stranded on Lakeshore Drive. Here's the after effects of Hurricane Katrina from a few, a few years ago. And, we can see these are rare events, uh, but very impactful, and they bring about a lot of damages. So kind of understanding how these types of events are changing is really a major challenge. Uh, because first off, can we model them, right? Can we observe them? Can we model them? Do we have a large enough sample size to do robust statistics? What are the relevant uncertainties? When we're using different models, different methods, we're going to lead to different uncertainties. What are the physical drivers of the, of the extremes? Uh, how are the physical drivers changing? What is the variability? What is the response to climate change? And uh, again, kind of what is the variability and how are they changing? So uh, these are big questions and I don't, I don't pretend to have the answers to all of them. In fact, throughout most of this short talk, I'll probably raise more questions than I answer. Uh, but again, you know, hopefully this is provo uh, thought provoking. And so when we're talking about high reliabilities then, or quantifying the tails, uh, the high reliabilities require information about the upper tails and uh, for the probability density functions. So here's an example of just say a, a, a distribution of a common climate variable. Here we have the mean, uh, the 90% quantile, here's the one in a thousand event. And so what we really wanna know is kind of how are these tails changing? Right, we, we take a long-term kind of climate average or meteorological average, we can get a, a, a general distribution for, for the, the mean statistics, but how are, the, how are the, the tails changing? This is a much more difficult uh, uh, question to answer. And a lot of times we'll use techniques such as risk curves or something like this, which helps highlight, this is one minus the cumulative frequency here on the right, helps highlight the, the tails on a log scale. So uh, coming back to the talk, we'll kind of use this type of terminology, this type of framework for analyzing tails. So we might ask how robust are these tails? 
and how are the tails changing? So again, do we have a lot, enough events to, <clears throat> to adequately sample the tail? And uh, do we have a, a long enough time period to be able to analyze how the statistics are changing over time? Okay. Here's an example of how the tails can change. Uh, this is a, a, out of an IPCC report showing kind of a conceptual example of uh, changes in the distributions associated with temperature. So here's shifted mean, here's the, the solid line is the previous climate, black dash line is some future current climate. Here's a shift in the mean, we just shift the distribution to warmer temperatures, increased variability, the mean stays the same, but the tails spread, right? The, the, the width of the distribution spreads, which again has an effect on the tail. And here's a change in the shape, such as perhaps some change in the symmetry of the tail, which again, all three of these changes in the, in the distribution, right, the, 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 the statistical moments can change, uh, have different effects on the, on the tails. So, un, so kind of deconvolving all of these uh, different effects is a, again, a major challenge, but something that we're trying to do using all these different climate models. And so that was a conceptual example, but we do have observational evidence that their tails are changing, that we're seeing more and more extreme events. So this is out of the recent <coughs> uh, no, uh, national climate assessment showing record warm daily temperatures are occurring more often over time. Here's the red and the red bar graph shows more record high daily record highs. Blue is more daily record lows. So over time we're seeing uh, essentially record highs outpacing record lows, which again means that there's being, there's, there's changes in the underlying climatology, the underlying distributions are changing with time, which is then having an effect on our, on our weather. Uh, also extreme precipitation is increasing over time, so on and so forth. We see uh, evidence across uh, multiple observational platforms of, of robust changes in, the, in, in extreme events, particularly related, related to temperature and precipitation. So the question then is, can we model these processes, right? We are observing them. We kind of know conceptually, qualitatively that it's happening, but, but can we model them and do the climate models capture these extreme events and changes in the extremes? So being that this is a kind of multidisciplinary audience, I thought we would just start with what is a climate model, right? Here's a, 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 a nice figure out of Hayhoe's chapter from the National Climate Assessment recently showing a climate modeling timeline where kind of over time, the last 140 years or so, 130 years, shows from radiative transfer or energy balance models up through the 1950s and 1960s where we have atmosphere, ocean, general circulation models. So here early on, climate was not considered, we didn't consider the dynamics of the climate system, just the radiative balance. 50s and 60s, we start bringing in nonlinear fluid dynamics, hydrological cycle, then we bring in uh, sea ice, land surface, and now in recent years, we're doing aerosols, vegetation, bio biogeochemical cycles, and carbon. It's, tr it's become a truly uh, an earth system model. But as the models have become more comprehensive and more complex, they also become more computationally demanding. So if we run a climate model that say ha has no dynamics, just as based on radio equilibrium or radio balance, we can run a model like that on a single processor in just a fraction of a second. <clears throat> as we start to add dynamics, ocean atmosphere dynamics, we start to get in the realm of needing hundreds of processors. And these models are typically on the range of say one to two degrees. And nowadays we're getting into to, to full carbon cycle, full, full chemistry, full coupling uh, between these different model components. So we're running in CPUs now in the thousands, right? Where we have ultra, very fine scale resolutions, less than a, a degree, sometimes less than a quarter of a degree, fully coupled where we could require thousands of computers just to run a single simulation. So does that make sense when we're trying to sample uncertainties, particularly in the tails, going to finer and finer scale, more and more computationally expensive or more and more computational expense means fewer and fewer runs, fewer and fewer years, perhaps, uh, which doesn't necessarily connect well when we're trying, when we need more and more data to be able to robustly capture, uh, robustly sample the tails. So models are higher resolution, more computationally expensive, but are the tails better? 
and what are the trade-offs? So here's a simple cartoon kind of showing the trade-offs between model complexity and <clears throat> or model realism and number of simulations, showing that as you go to finer and finer scale or more and more complex, the number of simulations that you can get for a, for a constant computational cost goes down. On the other hand, if I have a very simple model, I can do lots and lots of simulations, right? So I can do robust or rigorous or say a comprehensive uncertainty quantification, but I sacrifice the physics. On the other hand, I can, I can, I can run extremely complex or comprehensive models that capture the physics, but uh, I have now less years or, or fewer number of runs in order to uh, perform the statistics. So ultimately, Right, so simple models are tractable, tractable but lack realism. Complex models are more mechanistically sound, but computationally efficient. Ultimately, we want to be up in this region where we have realistic models and lots and lots of simulations. But how do we get there? You know, there's, at this point, there's, there's trade-offs between realism and tractability. Okay. And so what do we talk about when we're talking about sources of prediction uncertainty anyway? Well, there's three kind of major sources of prediction uncertainty when we're thinking about climate models. The first is internal variability, which is the natural or unforced variability of the system or the year-to-year -year variability or the model's weather, if you will. And that's shown here in the on the left plot with the by the orange curves, which kind of represent this and envelope a range of uncertainty just due to the year-to-year -year natural variability within the model. We also have the model of structural uncertainty. This is for different, every model has different resolutions, different physics, different numerical formulations. These lead to different simulated responses to a given forcing or a given set of in, in inputs. And this is represented here in the blue. This is the larger spread, larger uncertainties due to model, model structural differences than the internal variability, and you also see that these tend to diverge over time, right? So we're talking about prediction timescales of, say, 50, 60 years. Uh, the, the model structural uncertainties become larger and larger. And then we also have the forcing uncertainties. This is our incomplete knowledge about future emissions. This is why uh, there's multiple RCPs. There's multiple scenarios when we do these uh, international climate assessments uh, for uh, just to account for these forcing uncertainties. And you can see on long time scales, kind of centennial time scales or multi multi decadal time scales, these are the, the forcing uncertainties are what dominate. So if we partition the uncertainties kind of as a function of predictive time scale, we see that within the kind of one to 10 years or so, the internal variability dominates, right? The year to year weather fluctuations, uh, but that quickly dissipates or quickly uh, uh, re uh, become small compared to the uh, model structural uncertainties and then ultimately the uh, forcing uncertainties which which dominate by the end of the century. But the partitioning of the uncertainties is also a function of scale and the, uh, the internal variability is magnified as you go to smaller and smaller scales as it should, as it makes sense because weather itself the, the, the effect of weather becomes larger and larger as you go to fall, uh, smaller and smaller scales. As we average over large spatial regions or over long temporal, uh, temporal time periods, uh, we reduce the effect of the weather. All right, so these are a few of the sources of uncertainties. We've talked about climate models. So the question then is, do the climate models capture relevant climate metrics, right? When we're talking about extremes in particular, well, before we get to extremes, let's look at just standard climate variables. So this is an example uh, showing Midwestern U.S. monthly summer temperature for the last 50 years for uh, two different climate ensembles and one data set. So the red, uh, the, the black here is observations from the University of Delaware. The red is the C, is, a, is an internal vari uh, CESS, CESM ensemble, which is a single climate model, but we ran an initial conditions uh, experiment where we varied the initial conditions to mimic the effect of internal variability. So the red uh, curve here represents a, uh, an ensemble of 50 climate simulations 
from one model with varying initial conditions. And then the blue is a different ensemble, CMIP. This is uh, from the coupled model in our comparison phase five, uh, where we take 30 some, 35 different models in a single, single model simulation from each one. So this uh, ensemble is sampling the structural differences between models and we'll kind of compare and contrast the differences between internal, the effects of internal variability versus model structural differences on uh, temperature here. And here for when we're looking at just standard kind of US summer monthly summer temperature, all of the distributions look pretty consistent. The, you could say both of these models do reasonably well at capturing uh, mean summer temperature, but then we could say, well, what about the tails? What if we focus specifically on the tails? And if we do that, so this is now showing a risk curve of the 50 year annual block maxima daily temperature. So there's a little bit of a different statistic. We're taking the warmest temperature of the year and then creating a, a, a distribution of 50 values. So it's the warmest temperature of the year over 50 years. And this is our risk curve. So one minus the cumulative frequency. Black dots here are the observations. Blue now is from our internal variability ensemble showing that we underestimate the magnitude of the tail. Uh, red here is now the CMIP-5 ensemble, which shows that the models are kind of all over the place. So you look at CESM, you could say, okay, there's a, there's a bias here in the tail in capturing the block, uh, the, block uh, the annual block maximum val uh, temperature value, but the shape and the scale look pretty good. We just need to kind of uh, shift the location over. For CMIP, however, uh, these models kind of show all kinds of different statistics or uh, uh, values of the of the maximum temperature, and some of them overestimated it by almost a factor of two, which shows that these models, even though they're getting the mean statistics right or kind of the, the, the standard climate variables right, when you come to more, let's say, decision relevant extreme statistics, the models don't do a very good job. I don't want to. I don't want to disparage the models. I don't want to say they don't do a good job because they're not really designed to get the tails, right? But we we use them to do ex, to to analyze extreme events. So we need to kind of interrogate them in a way uh, to understand how how well they can capture these types of statistics. All right. So this leads us then to downscaled model products. <clears throat> this can help reduce biases. Uh, so here's an example of. Uh, using the next pro the next product, which is the NASA Earth Exchange Global Daily Downscaled Projections. This is this this method takes 21 CMIP models and uh, statistically bias corrects them via quantile mapping against an observational data set known as the Global Meteorological Forcing Data Set, uh, which is used for hydrologic applications. And then it's downscaled via spatial disaggregation to a quarter of a quarter of a degree, and the mean and variance are altered, but the trends are not. So you can think of this as a nice handy tool for taking all of the CMIP models, downscaling them statistically using quantile, uh, a form of quantile regression or quantile mapping to 25 to a quarter degree by quarter degree grid globally for analyzing uh, daily temperature and precipitation. So we thought, okay, if the models aren't able to capture the tails, why don't we look at the downscaled products and see if the downscaled products can capture the tails? So here's a list of all the CMIP models that are used in the, in the next data sets. And here's an example then of how, uh, of how one model in CMIP or in the next products capture the tails. This is uh, annually averaged daily temperature exceedances greater than 30 degrees Celsius for a 50 year period. So that's the number of days where the temperature exceeds 30 degrees Celsius. This is from our observations. This is the mean and standard deviation. Uh, this is for one model, one CMIP model showing uh, the raw model output. For the, this is for the CCSM4 model, which is the NCAR model. The native model is at one degrees, and we can see that you have large biases, right? So the observations on the left side, center column, we can see large biases and the number of exceedances also large biases in the in the year to year variability the standard deviation and when you go to the nasa next or the next product at 25 kilometers you can see here now finer scale finer resolution also a lot of these biases are fixed uh, or I shouldn't say fixed but 
reduced compared to the observations. Some biases persist, but it looks a lot more like the observations than the, than the raw model output did, except when you go to year-to-year -year variability. When you go to year-to-year -year variability, uh, the bias correction hasn't really fixed this problem. So when we're thinking about um, not just the statistics, but the time variations of the statistics, the bias correction may or may not fix the problem. And ultimately, uh, when we look at different models, all of these relationships look different. There's not really a consistent uh, fix or a consistent change that's made from uh, based on this uh, downscaling technique. So there's still uncertainties, even after the bias corrections and the downscaling, there's still uncertainties. And we kind of thought, well, well how are these uncertainties going to affect uh, different types of uh, variables across different sectors, not just in the climate and weather communities. So we started thinking about agriculture because agriculture is quite uh, sensitive to extreme temperature. <clears throat> so this is a very famous paper from 2009 by Schlenker and Roberts showing uh, corn yields as a function of temperature. And you can see that when you get above this certain temperature threshold, uh, corn, yield, corn yields start to go down drastically. Right, so ag yields are very sensitive to extreme temperature of above 28 degrees C or so, corn starts to deteriorate very rapidly. And so we thought, how are these extremes changing, uh, particularly growing degree days, and what are the effects on the yields? Again, these are difficult questions because of all the uncertainties and the, the uncertainty propagation, particularly from the cement models to the downscaled products, doesn't always fix the, the uh, biases in the original uh, models. And so, we wanted to investigate this a bit. So here we're looking at degree days, growing degree days, where we can see here in the green, we can we can define a growing degree day as integrated temperature. So we integrate temperature between two values over, over a certain day and a given day. And when the temperature is within this range, the green range, the corn is happy and the corn grows. And then when the, the temperature exceeds this this, this maximum or this threshold, if you will, corresponding to this red line, then the corn deteriorates. The corn is not happy, and this is detrimental to the corn. So we wanted to know how are the extreme growing degree days changing, or how are they captured in these models, and how are they changing over time? Okay, so we implemented a statistical yield model based on the Schlenker and Roberts, kind of an updated Schlenker and Roberts uh, version uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into this too deeply, but what we're measuring here is some record, or what we're estimating is some recorded yield. We have climate and weather influence. We have county fixed uh, effects. We also have technological time trend, but what we'll focus on here are the climate and weather influences, which are, which are very sensitive to extreme temperature. So this is a nice model because it's detailed enough to be realistic, but it's simple enough to be interpretable. Uh, it, we, we use growing degree days and extreme growing degree days and precipitation as our inputs. And then uh, we can assess model skill based by comparing to historical yields. And then we train on 50 years of data and then we validate on final 10. Okay. So here's just some very uh, brief results showing the, kind of evaluating the model. Again, this work has been being led by David Lafferty. Um, and this is work in progress, but uh, uh, it's very close to submission. And so this is showing the yield model coefficient of determination measured against USD records for our statistical model. And we can see that as a function of time over the past 50 years or so, we can get a pretty good fit. The red is the USDA, uh, our Blue line is our quadratic fit plus our yield model. So our yield model is very good at capturing the variability or the, the kind of the shocks, if you will, to this long-term kind of trend in, uh, in, in yield outputs. And then the green here is the correlation. The color up above on the map is the correlation with between our, our statistical model and the real yields. Uh, gray is blocked out. If we didn't have enough data, we just left it out of the analysis. So in particular, we get a pretty good correlation, pretty good fit over the Corn Belt, which is where we're going to focus a lot of the attention. Okay, so what we did was say, kind of, we'll just summarize some of the key findings here, but what we did is say, 
all right, we've got a nice statistical model that works pretty well for observations. Let's now run it, or let's now run all of the climate model outputs through this stat model, all of the CMIP models, all of the next models, uh, the GMFD data, we'll put it all through the statistical model, which we even can retune the statistical model to fit to be based on the GMFD instead of the US, instead of the USDA temperature, we base it on the GMF, GMFD temperature so that we can better fit uh, what the actual observational data sets are that are driving the, the, the downscaling. And then we can compare and contrast the outputs from the statistical model to kind of look at how do the uncertainties in the tails kind of propagate through the statistical model to affect the ult ultimately affect the yields. And so here's a couple of the results. National level yield anomalies during the historical period. Gray here is from GMFD. Red is the CMIP models. Blue is our downscaled and bias corrected next products. And what we find is that if you're looking at the kind of deviation of yields from year to year, the CMIP models are just way too wide, right? Again, because there's so much all the structural differences in the models, the temperature distributions are too broad, uh, and the the next downscaling helps fix this, makes bring the the distribution of yields closer to the observed distributions. But then when we look at the uh, sampling distributions and the summary statistics, here's a couple of them. Here's standard deviation, median absolute deviation, and then largest. This is can't see behind this square on my screen, but I think this is largest negative shock, a yield shock. So we see again in standard deviation, median absolute deviation, uh, next kind of fixes this bias or reduces the bias uh, from the CMIP models. But when we're looking at largest negative yield shocks or a metric again for a tail area event, uh, here is where now the uh, the next underrepresents or or underestimates the the magnitude of the shock, right? It underestimates the magnitude of the tail. So this is an instance where when you're bias correcting, uh, downscaling bias correcting leads to overconfidence. And this is just based on the historical record uh, because you're, uh, it leads to undersampling of the tails in this case. And then we can kind of push this out to, into the future and say, all right, so that's for the historical period. What are the implications for future projections? Well, this is just a couple of examples looking at corn belt hindcasts. This is extreme growing degree days. And yellow is observations, red is next, CMIP is, is gray. And we see that, again, bias correction and downscaling in the next products help get the uh, help. Uh, reduce the amount of spread within the CMIP models to match. So the next matches the observed statistics more closely, which then leads to a much more narrow distribution uh, going forward. But it could also be argued that the next variables uh, don't capture the internal variability or the year to year variability of the extreme events because of the uh, um, because of the overconfidence, which then leads to overconfidence in the project projections. And indeed, then when we look at then projected changes in, in yield in, in yield changes, we see a similar pattern where the next may potentially underestimate uh, negative shocks due to the overconfidence and undersampling of the tails. Um, finally, we can kind of take this one step further to look at hazard assessments or look at return periods of extreme negative shocks. Again, we find for the historical period, CMIP5 is underconfident. The distributions are too wide. Next is overconfident, right? It tends to cut off the tails. And then, um, so that in, in terms of future projections, we see re robust responses and yield variability for all of the models, but uh, key differences in the tails, which can have implications uh, for projected return period estimates of extreme yield shocks. So in this case, uh, next tends to uh, uh, underestimate the return periods, or there's a large kind of downward bias in return periods for large event uh, yield shocks compared to the CMET models. Okay, so I'll just wrap up with a few of the conclusions. Again, this is a lot of work is kind of ongoing, so the conclusions aren't all that conclusive at this point. But um, we find that the global climate models and downscaled products uh, still exhibit large variations in extreme temperature.
the uncertainties uh, can be propagated or amplified in an agricultural model, uh, which is particularly sensitive to extreme to extremes. And then our statistical capture statistical model captures the historical period pretty well, uh, while remaining interpretable. But the uh, but the downscaled products underestimate the frequency of large shock events. And then ultimately, this introduces a trade off uh, for practitioners or people that are using this data and kind of applied uh, applied or multi sector analysis in the sense that you need to be careful or not. You need to think about or consider the trade offs in the statistical downscaling and the bias correction methods of the data sets you're using. Uh, they may fit the data better, but they may lead to overconfidence when you're trying to estimate the statistics and the tails, right? And this kind of makes sense in the sense that, right, these climate models, we, we, we're running the climate models because we want to understand how the climate is changing, right? And what is the climate? But the climate is a 30-year a, a average of the weather. So we want to understand how the statistical moments of the weather are changing over time. But when we bias correct and downscale or statistically downscale, this is difficult to do because we're more or less making the data fit the observed statistics. So how can we analyze how statistical moments are changing when we've already, already kind of limited our ability to interpret those changes by making the statistics look more like the observations? So um, with that, I think I will end and I'll hand it over to, the, uh, uh, to Tom and Jenny. So thanks everybody for your time. Thank you, Ryan. So we have about 12 minutes for Q and A. Do we have any people with questions? If you do, please use the raise your hand button or you can type your question into the chat box. I know that Tom has a question for you. Should we pick it off with Tom first? Thanks for a great talk, uh, Ryan. Uh, since this webinar is focusing on the data science tools for climate applications, I was wondering if you could guide us through in two, three minutes about how exactly you, uh, your uncertainty quantification is done, since it was one of the main focuses of your talk. Yes, so um, we had to be somewhat selective in which models we were using. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're using multiple ensembles where we try to identify different aspects of the uncertainties within the ensembles. So for example, we use a large uh, initial conditions ensemble uh, using a single model, which represents our uncertainties in the internal variability. Uh, in reality, all of the models have their own internal variability, and you would almost need to represent each of those individually in order to get a full sampling across all of the, the, the multi-model ensemble. But for our purposes, we just take a single model and, and then estimate that, that uh, effect from internal variability. And then for the structural model uncertainties, we take a collection of models from CMIP uh, where we try, to limit the, uh, we try to limit the interactions between the internal variability and the structural model variability by just taking a single simulation from each modeling group. Uh, again, all of the models and groups will provide mo different numbers of simulations, which again, have their own intrinsic variability and so on and so forth. So to limit that effect, we just take a single model run from each group and uh, that represents our structural uncertainties. And then we uh, take the next products, which then capture the, the, the effects, the uncertainties on the due to the downscaling and bias correction. So in all, we're talking about, you know, terabytes of data, uh, but once we have all of the data collected, running it through our statistical model is somewhat, we can automate that to where it's just a, you know, just, uh, I think the collecting, acquiring the data and pre-processing the data is the biggest challenge. Once it's ready, then running it through our stats models is, it's more or less just plug and chug. Yeah, thank you. And and then going back to your statistical yield model, I was wondering if you had designed it uh, specifically with uncertainty quantification in mind, or if you're assuming it will describe, uh, for example, structural and 
intermodal structural uncertainty well because it's able to describe uh, interannual variability well. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so th this model uh, typically has is is uh, it's a well known model that's been around for a while. It's a statistical yield model. So it's typically uh, uh, based on USDA records or observational records. So what we did is just kind of turn it around and just base it completely on the model outputs uh, so that we can look at then, right? Because ultimately that's what we want to know is what is the effect of the uncertainties or the differences in the tails, particularly related to the extremes, once they propagate through a an integrated model such as a such as the stats model which then integrates these effects uh and and ultimately their uh their impact on the yields so by doing it that way using each model as kind of the basis for the each of the numerical models as the basis for the stat model we're able to see what what those effects of the different model structures initial conditions and so on and so forth have then ultimately on on the yields. Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay. All right. I see a question in the chat box. This is from Jose Molina. He says, Ryan, I have been working with ensemble NEX GDDP precipitation and temperature in Ethiopia for projecting runoff in the country basins. The big problem, as you said, is future variability. Prospective GDDP has a huge and unrealistic spread in the future monthly and daily precipitation temperature, and thus high projections of runoff based on statistical predictive models. What is your guess or your suggestion to bias correct future variability in GDDP so we can produce realistic traces of runoff? Um, that's a good question. Um... I think the bias correction, the 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 downscaling methods used by Next uh, work very well when you have good data coverage. So in areas where you don't have good observations or good data coverage, the effect is probably going to be limited, and you'll be left with more model spread. Uh, Precip is a difficult is a real challenge in the models to begin with because there's a lot of variability and there's not a lot of agreement in how the precipitation is changing over time. Uh, we've we we strategically focused on this ag yield model because the only high frequency variability it accounts for is temperature, which is easier to model for it's easier to capture in the models, and then the precipitation that goes into the ag model is 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 an aggregated or accumulated uh, precip over the entire season. So, my one suggestion would be to maybe focus on more. Uh, integrated water metrics, if you can, um, daily precip may not uh, be so skillful, but perhaps, I don't know, weekly or something more, something, something longer, longer time scale may be more useful, maybe more uh, reliable, but then also perhaps not as suitable for your needs if you're dealing with high frequency, uh, high frequency extremes. But otherwise, I don't have a I don't have a really solid answer for that at this point. Precip is something that we're looking at now, uh, and in particular, how it uh, how it may affect uh, land surface processes and hydrology. And I did share that question in the chat box if people wanted to reread it. Um, do we have any other questions for Ryan? And I think Mike Pritchard has a question. Go ahead. Hey, Ryan, thanks. Um, so, uh, I, you know, just zoom out a bit. Um, it was really interesting to hear this. Oh, sorry, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, if I understood correctly, you very strategically mined a huge archive of data. Um, you made some pretty uh, crafty decisions on how to mine on the one hand for internal variability, on the other hand, structural uncertainty, and then ultimately the statistical model that you used to, to unveil trade offs uh, in how all this affects our impression of the tails was a, a standard statistical model based on regression against things like rain degree days. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering in this in this uh, 
strange era we're living in where they're proliferating statistical models that can do uh, things I, I never dreamed of in high dimensions. Um, what you're, what, you know, whether you're daydreaming about um, ways in which this issue of this downscaling climate models, uh, you know, can or can't interact or be compatible with the blooming data science tools of emerging from computer science. I'm thinking about two issues loosely, you know, one being the, the tend to damp variance that happens when you regress in general. Uh, you spoke to issues of insufficient variance in these methods. Um, and also, but also like some provocative talks we've had in this uh, this series, um, thinking of one by Claire Montalioni about uh, sort of transforming the view of downscaling using these align flow techniques that allow you to uh, synthesize surprisingly coherent, uh, um, or you know, like latent spaces that provide coherent um, uh, structures on both high and low resolution scales. Yeah, anyways, yeah. What, what, what's your what's your feeling these days? Or are you day streaming? Or? Uh, I like the idea of it when it comes to the, the, so the big question that kind of keeps coming back to me is what drives the variability? What drives the differences in the models from a uh, dynamics perspective? And, uh, that's really hard to get at. Um, but, uh, I think the machine learning techniques or deep learning can be quite helpful with that in order to kind of connecting large scale variability or large scale processes with the with the regional scale extremes. Uh, if we can exploit kind of nonlinear relationships between extreme temperature and precipitation with what happens at the larger scale. Uh, these are those are some interesting ideas uh, that that we've been playing around with. Also, uh, there is the idea of of using very fine scale outputs to kind of help fill in the gaps from the low resolution models to the high resolution models using uh, machine learning. So if you have like a very fine scale model that you're that you're confident can capture the, the coherence of the signal and then base it on uh, base it on some low resolution model as your inputs to help as a downscaling tool. I mean, I think that would help, that would significantly help lessen the computational workload of just running all of these models to begin with. You know, if <clears throat> we run, we use thousands and thousands of CPUs to run these extremely complex models, but what if we just needed to run these really high resolution models like a couple of times in order to capture the right, the right patterns and the right kind of uh, uh, teleconnection patterns and such, and then we can just run it back through the uh, the machine learning techniques to then just mimic this effect for lower resolution scales. Uh, these are yeah, I, I, these are quite cutting edge ideas. Uh, I don't know quite how to get you know my head around it at this point, but these are certainly things that I think are are useful and interesting going forward. Are you are you noticing any captivating examples that are cap catching your attention? Um... Or, or facing any issues if, if, as you try to use these tools yourself that would be worth um, discussing as a group? Um, so I've, we have not done anything for statistical downscaling. I've seen this used for uh, dynamical downscaling of regional, regional models. Um, but not, I have not seen this at the large scale sense. I mean, yeah, we've done this from a very kind of generic standpoint, like a, 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 a um, toy example of say ENSO, for example, can we, can we predict ENSO using machine learning? If we just give some simple ingredients from climate models, such as, uh, uh, sea, you know, tropical sea surface temperature, and uh, MJO activity or uh, uh, the uh, upper westerlies in the tropics and then ocean heat content. And by just passing on, passing in these three simple large scale ingredients, we're able to kind of capture stochastic variability, uh, you know, month to month predictive, predictive variability for Nino uh, SST regions. And uh, that was quite uh, interesting <clears throat> but we have not been able, we haven't, the student that was working on that kind of left our group. And so we haven't been able to kind of expand this into say, okay, well then just instead of using like one model or one data set, 
let's just use all of the data from all of the models and see how, how well we can do this. Just kind of really throw the kitchen sink at it. We were trying to keep it small scale and didactic in a way that we could understand what was actually coming out of this model. So we say, okay, when we add this ingredient, we can now get this back and so on and so forth. When you start throwing more, when you start more ingesting more and more data into the, into the algorithm, you start to lose sense of scientifically what's causing what, what's responding to what. Um, but it's a, but it's a definitely an interesting idea. Thanks. Yeah, just hearing those reactions was very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right, we have one final question in the chat, so let's conclude with this one. Um, so Jan Galkowski asks, per the sketch by Lee Fawcett in Significance, it's a 2019 Royal Statistical Society, I think that might be, uh, PP15FF, correct me if I'm butchering this, but have you tried any extreme value theory in your studies? Limitations, not enough observations. That's a great question. Yes, we have. So we've, we have uh, looked at, um, uh, GE using uh, generalized extreme value distributions. We've looked using block maxima. We've looked uh, at um, estimating tail parameters, and the 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 real challenge there is just lack of years. Uh, so when we run these models, we have maybe fifty years of you know to compare against observational data, and then you know maybe another hundred years or so for the historical hindcasts, and then a hundred years of future projections which in total, you know, we have maybe 250 years or so, but that's just not enough time, in my opinion, or that we found to be able to get robust statistical samples of the tails of the, of the tail parameters. Uh, having said all of that, using the initial conditions ensembles where we just run a single, you have a single model, but you run it 50 times, 100 times, over and over, those are much more useful for, uh, for, looking at the extremes and uh, we published a, a series of papers uh, with Michael Stein and uh, Matt Haugen from the University of Chicago a few years back about uh, looking at distributions or changes in, in, in the high quantiles and uh, look, using extreme or changes in extreme statistics, extreme value statistics using large ensembles kind of getting at the question of how much data, how many simulations do you need to really capture long time scale um, uh, tail statistics. And so uh, if you take a look at my webpage, right, I can send, whoever asked that, I can send around some papers on, on that topic. Okay, great, I can put you two in touch. Okay. Um, all right, so thank you, Ryan, for giving us the presentation and answering everyone's questions. Um, I think at this point, we will conclude our open session of today's webinar. As I said earlier, a recording will be shared later this week. Coming up in September, there is a slight schedule change and we will only have one webinar. So please join us on September 28th for a talk by Verona, Veronica Barakal, Associate Professor of the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Sciences of UC Irvine. Uh, her research interests include environmental sciences, atmospheric and geophysical sciences, climate change, environmental health, environmental and so social epidemiology, and health inequities. So until then, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about U.S. Clivar or the working group, or if you want me to um, put you in touch with Ryan. So thank you all for joining.